One of the fundamental things that will be needed to build that kind of system in New Testament perspective is the song of the Spirit. Our generation has not yet come to fully understand the essence of the ministry of the psalmist. And that's why we walk in dry places. In patchlands and our soul is overwhelmed. It doesn't matter how many mountains you had to climb to get to this place. If your soul touches the river of life, your weariness will be taken away. Let me show you a scripture before we connect with um, our lesson for today. Job, the book of Job. aware of the fact that we understand to some extent the meaning of the book of Job. And if you are a very diligent scholar of the Bible, you will know that that is the first book of the Bible. That's the first book that was written in terms of chronology. And the book of Job was written where the revelations of God were in its cradle. The way God does it is that it begins with a little stream. And then subsequent people that receive the baton to bear witness of God now increase the streams. And then in the book of Revelation, the curtain is removed so that we can see the context and the concept of kingdom administration and the things that God puts in place in order to accomplish his plan that he has ordained before the foundation of the world. And just in case you understood the book of Revelation, the meaning is that nothing changed anything. If you serve God or not, it will not change anything. If you decide to fulfill your call or not, it will not change anything. Nothing changed anything. So God will still fulfill his end. He will still achieve his intention, whether I serve him or I serve him not. So to serve him is a privilege to be part of something that is so ancient, more ancient than the foundations of the world. So the revelations of God were in his cradle. And the people that gave direction to humanity at the time were the cardinals, the custodians of philosophy. And at every time on the face of the earth, there, in those days, there were four cardinals, four custodians of philosophy. And it happens to be that Job was the custodian of the East. So when things happen, people, human beings want to understand why they happen. So they will get one of the cardinals. So he comes and he brings his philosophy and explains the reason why this thing has taken place. And if you want to avoid this kind of thing, we should stop doing this kind of thing. So it was through the wisdom that manifested through those cardinals that culture Society, sociology was built around. There were, there were significant entities in their realm. So that was how life was in those days until one of the cardinals became afflicted. The one that is supposed to explain <laughs> became afflicted. So the others were summoned from their places to diagnose his condition. I don't want to take you on a theological journey. 
but I will I have enough time to say at least that the philosophical position of Job was self-righteousness and Job's argument was that there was nothing that he had done that qualified him for the kind of suffering he was going through notice that the revelations of God were in his cradle so the reason why God will allow someone that is devoted to him to suffer to pass through some suffering was not yet fully known those were the days where the doctrine was according to karma <laughs> are you still here I don't have time to do the job to show you one of the cardinals his philosophy was based on on uh, personal merit that anything that happens to you there was a cause that generated this effect I would have shown you the theological the philosophical position of each of these individuals and Job held the position of self-righteousness in the New Testament we now understand that the, uh, the suffering is not a sign that you are broken covenant with God it can actually be a sign that you are in sync with God because are you there because Jesus uttered our salvation through suffering and there's a measure of it that every one of us will be in administering his purposes upon the face of the earth so but this knowledge was not there then so they were trying to understand what it was that was responsible for Job's condition. So this wisdom was so deep that even the cardinals did not have sufficient depth to decipher what was at work. So they were forced to allow God to come bring perspective and we see God bringing perspective in Job chapter 38 just in case you have a Bible then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said who is this that darkened counsel by words without knowledge? What does it mean for counsel to be darkened by words without knowledge? It means just in case you had an encounter with God, you had some business with God, and there were some things that were impressed upon your spirit that you are convinced about, that this is the present revelation position of the spirit. If you meet Job, and Job begins to speak words that, that darken counsel, even the counsel you receive from your own intercourse with God, you will begin to doubt it because he is speaking words that are not rooted in spiritual knowledge. Can you see the trouble that can result when someone sets up a church and he doesn't have spiritual knowledge he will darken counsel who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge so God when he came to bring his perspective his first comment was a rebuke He felt irritated when he heard the cardinal speak. And those were the scholars of the time. There was no spiritual knowledge in what they were saying. So he now said, all right, so you guys, Job, you, you, you say you are righteous. Okay. He said, give up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer thou me. You know, the Bible says counsel in the heart of a man is like deep waters. A man of understanding draweth it out. So God wanted to test the depth of Job. 
now that you say that you are self-righteous and you can confront me in the court of justice judgment and equity you want my own testimony because you believe that you are right in your ways say all right get up your lungs get ready i'm going to test your depth by asking you some questions because counsel in the heart of the man is like what like deep waters and a man of understanding draws it out how does he draw it out with questions so i want to draw your depth i want to test your depth first question he said where was thou when i laid the foundation so there declare if you have understanding Because some of the things that you are experiencing now were built into the foundation of the earth. So if you were not there, you would not see the cables that are running from that point. You, you are limited. You don't even stand a chance to question me in court if I decide to condescend to the level of getting to hear your view. We are not ancient enough. So in the journey and in the battle of the spirit, the, ancient, the more ancient you are, the more victories you have. Because Satan is a created being. Hmm? That angel called Lucifer. Okay, you are not with me. I've gone too far for you. Satan was created. There were things that were set in motion before Satan came up. And that's why the Bible is full of the miscalculations of the devil. Because he doesn't have understanding of things that were fasting into the foundations of things. So when God speaks, he doesn't speak plainly. He concocts a parable before he speaks. Such a parable that only him can unveil. Because he doesn't want deep things to be available at face value. Part of the reason is because he needs to keep with the spirit and with the um, policy of secrecy that undergird spiritual things. It's not of him that will it. It's not of him that run it. It's of God that shows mercy. Whenever Jesus walked around, he sees someone afflicted, he breaks the chain, comes to the synagogue, you will expect that the place will be pious and sanctimonious. And that's how it was. Until Jesus shows up. When he shows up, a seemingly conservative man in the synagogue begins to manifest. And uh, there was nothing previously in the man's conduct that suggested that there was a demon on his life. Then the people now registered their observation. What a world is this? You know, it's, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. What is happening? Because our teachers were the scribes and the Pharisees. Did this dimension? What? What a world is this? And when they said what a world is this, I was expecting the title of the message. Because what, what they meant was what a message is this? I expected the title. Instead, they said with authority and with power. He commanded the unclean spirits and they come out. And such was not the capacity that was given to the Pharisees that were the teachers and the exhorters in the synagogue. He brought a dimension that could not be understood by the mind of man. Who is this that darkens counsel? By words without knowledge. See, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Speak if you have understanding. Who had laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest. 
And who had stretched forth the line upon it? If you did uh, masters in mathematics, there is a course called circle geometry. That's, he, he's talking about circle geometry. People like Aristosthenes of the Greeks are the ones that came up with all those strange formulas. And Aristosthenes was the first man that calculated the diameter of the earth and he didn't, he didn't travel to outer space. When Apollo 11 got to the moon and they took a picture of the earth from that point, they discovered that the calculations of Aristosthenes were accurate. Who drew the line thereof? That's the diameter. Were you there when the diameter was calculated? So if you are not that ancient, what makes you think you can understand everything? You are standing on things that are bigger than you. That is, this earth, it, 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 is, it is standing without pillars. That is to tell you, it is from the New Testament that we now understand the five mysteries of the Bible. Things that you cannot understand except the creator himself comes to upgrade you through some form of capacity building. You are not that wise. Please help me tell your neighbor, you are not that wise. You are not. <laughs> Ooh. He's in custody of mysteries. And that's why if you want to work with him, don't try to be cerebral with him the, the way Job was, was. No, you can't cope. You, you, you know too little. And your knowledge doesn't fit into the stature of the context. It doesn't make sense. Because you cannot see from far enough. Your vision is microscopic. But his own vision is telescopic. He said, whereupon are the foundations thereof fasting, and who laid the cornerstone thereof? I hope you know Job is no longer here talking. <laughs> so is there anybody in this auditorium? My, hand needs, my, my hands need to be up too. That has ever asked God why before. Why? You don't have what it takes to ask why. Because the context for whence you draw your perception is such a limited context. It's a context that is rigged by time, by space. And it is a lie. That's why we walk by faith and not by sight. But the Bible says that the things that are seen, they are temporal. And the things that are not seen, they are eternal. The reason why I brought you here is not because of anything I've said. It's because of this. Verse 7. Because we are still talking about the song of the Spirit. Techniques by which we track the dimensions of heaven down on earth. He said, were you there when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? You know what this scripture means? It means that music was part of the fabric that was used to weave creation. The morning stars were singing, they were singing into the fabric of creation. And that's why if you hit anything, it will make sound. Because it was built into it. And that's why your hands, when you clap your hands, is. So 
So if we want to begin a construction to trap God down, oh, you're not with me, you're not with me. If we want to build something to trap God down, one of the, uh, the necessary fabrics we use for our building is the song of the Spirit. He said, were you there? Where the morning stars sang together and all the songs of God shouted for joy. How many of you have been in that place in the spirit where in order for you to find ventilation, you just need to shout? Have you been there before? And that is irrespective of your commitment to decorum. <laughs> there, are, there are dimensions of God that do not have um, logical expressions. And that's why in the book of Psalms, you will see that there are seven Hebrew words used for for praise. One of them is Shabbat, which is a shout that is born of the Spirit and it comes from the depth of the belly. That was the shout that was used to bring down the walls of Jericho. It was a Shabbat. The walls of Jericho was a cuboid like a cube of sugar if it falls you know a cube of sugar it will be the same height that it was when it was still standing so the wall of Jericho did not fall it sank and I'm telling you from the perspective of archaeologists they found the remains of the world intact underground. You know, Joshua had a conversation with the captain of the angelic side. The mystery about the army of Israel was that it was not only populated with mortal men, it was also populated with angelic kind. And that was what God wanted to show the general, Joshua when he took inventory of the walls of Jericho and he saw that it was a cuboid and it cannot be breached by any military tactics. He was frustrated and he went to meditate in the bush and then the angel showed himself. But unfortunately for Joshua, he spoke like a warrior. Are you for us or against us? And the angel said, nay, not for you and I'm not against you. My my marching orders come from another quarter. If I find you cooperating with my marching orders, I will cooperate with you. If I find you contradicting my marching orders, you are the first one that will come down by my sword. So you will now see that angels do not take instructions from you as you were taught. They told you to send your angel. But see, you have not studied your Bible. <laughs> that's that's fantasy preaching uh, making people just uh, taking them to the place called utopia where the realities of God are not Jesus was on the cross Jesus the master he was on the cross and what did Jesus say he said I would have prayed the father and he will send 12 legions of angels. Jesus did not say, let me command. Then you now, you have come to command. <laughs> Sometimes I hear some, some things, I laugh. For the past 15 years, there have been many reasons to laugh at what we call preaching. not for you, I'm not against you, but as a captain of the armies of the Lord, am I come. The punishment that was given to Joshua for that kind of communication was that he should keep quiet for seven days. He talks too much. And then on the seventh day, he should keep quiet and march around the wall seven times. 
when he does that he will begin to hear the rhythm of the marching of the invincible armies when the when the sequence of the match pass becomes one then they can now shabak and they are shabak we activate the angels to stand on the walls and stamp upon it and it will sink So those technologies of how the unseen realm moves and how to align with it and trap it and work with it to accomplish things that are impossible, we saw it littered across the Old Testament. Are you still with me? I have a prompting to stop, so I will not continue. Turn your Bible with me quickly to the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. The ministry of the psalmist will be re pioneered in our time. A few accredited psalmists are going to be given trumpets. And what I mean by that is that they'll be given uh, the capacity to sound the alarms of God. Those that have been given trumpets, you, you, there's a texture that is associated with their deliverables that makes it evident of the fact that the hand of God is at work. Because in the heated of battles, the tribe of Judah will lead. And there are several battles that the camp of God fights that they don't need to wield a sword. They need to sing the songs from the cities of Zion. I, I, don't, I, I speak in parables. I speak in parables. What scripture did I say she opened? What? Acts chapter 2. Yeah, okay, okay. Acts chapter 2. Sorry, I'm high in spirit. I'm high in spirit. Amen. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we see the secret of the apostles. And I'd like you to understand that these guys, these guys were following the script that Jesus dictated to them. Acts chapter 1 is a capacity building exercise that Jesus put in place to equip his apostles who will be saddled with the responsibility of extending the frontiers of the kingdom of God to equip them so that they will have what it takes to cause the gospel of the kingdom to reach the ends of the earth. So I, I don't have time to take you to Acts chapter 1 and show you the things Jesus did to them to make them competent ministers of the new covenant. Whenever we have the liberty to talk about apostolic patterns, then we'll start, the book of Acts will be our textbook. Then you will see many extra scriptural things that have been imported into the church that is the reason for our weakness. Because when God builds in the earth, it must be according to the pattern that was seen on the mount. Because the original hard copy of the patterns we want to implement upon the face of the earth, they are in heaven. Because his kingdom is established in the heavenlies. And in the heavenlies, his authority can be exercised to the fullest extent. And part and parcel of the prayer lecture that Jesus gave to his disciples was to pray that thy kingdom come, that thy will be done where? On earth, how? As it is done. So we are going to see a lot of things that have been imported into the church that have no representation in the heavens. So that, that happens when apostolic functionaries are not present in the body of Christ. 
importations, false gods. And the body of Christ will become weakened and darkness will fall on Goshen. Goshen is supposed to be a city that is built with an intimacy with God so that they, there's always light in Goshen. But when Goshen falls to darkness, the nations will bleed. Spirits from the underworld will manipulate the souls of many people. Turbulence will become the order of the day. Because if God wants to heal the nations, he uses the church. But if we are out of sync with patterns, we lack authority from the realm of God. I don't have time to do the lecture today. But we will do some apostolic recalibration. Then you will be amazed what is in the book of Acts. God is releasing the apostles massively again so that his church can be restored back to the way he wants it. Not the way that intelligent men want it. Because it must be according to what the pattern that is seen on the map. So when they entered into implementation in the book of Acts, oh, you're not with me. Are you there? Stay with me. After the lecture, they entered into implementation. Let me show you the first thing that they did. Then I'll show you the second thing that they did. Then I will stop. Then when we come for apostolic patterns, I will show you the seven things that they did. So I'll show you two today and five when we come. Then God will give us new eyes and he will give us new lenses Amen. so that we will be able to see. So let me show you Acts chapter 1 first and show you. Acts chapter 1 verse 16 is the first thing that they needed to do which was prescribed by Jesus. First thing. He said, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased the field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowers gushed out and it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem in so much as the field is called in the proper tongue, a keldema, that is to say, the field of blood. Then they go to scriptures as their authority. Even though, are you there? Then they pick a witness from scriptures. I say, for as it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and his bishopric let another take. Now, this is the policy direction. Stay with me. I was in the educational sector at some point in Nigeria. In Nigeria, there is something we call the attendance register. Do you have it here? In the attendance register, you need to make two strokes per day. That means the guy was present in the morning. He was also present before 
shortly before closing time. Are you, are you following? And if the guy is present in the morning, you mark like this. If he's absent in the afternoon, you put a zero there. You know what a zero means? He was supposed to be here. You're not with me. Every student has his own line on the register. That line is specific to the student. He cannot transfer that line to his cousin or his brother. It is specific to him. So, the line tells the story of his attendance to academic work. Are you there? So, if he's absent, it will be zero, zero. That means he was supposed to be here. Okay. Can you see what the scripture says? For it is written in the book of Psalms. Let his habitation be desolate. The habitation that is spoken about is his place in heaven. When we go to heaven, you will see the register. You will see a place carved for a man but is absent, zero, zero. Because his habitation cannot be transferred to another person. It belongs only to him. And if he doesn't make it, it will be clear. It will remain like that as a sign that he is not here. His habitation is not transferable. It will remain how? Desolate. You are, not, you are, you, are you with me? Okay. Mm. Mm. Then he said, Let his habitation be desolate, let no man dwell therein. But his bishopry, which is the one here in the natural, let another man take. <laughs> so another man can take his bishopry, but no man can take his habitation. After all is said and done, if we operate with accurate apostolic patterns, we'll be present in our habitation. It's a guarantee. And the layout is in the Bible. But when Babylon comes in, Babylon is governed by the spirit of the angel of commerce. And he trades in souls. His goal is that there will be a desolate habitation. Let his habitation be desolate. Let no man dwell therein. But his bishop, Rick, his calling, his assignment, let another take. Meditate on these words deeply. His calling can be reassigned. His bishopric can be reassigned. It's just like someone is in marriage and maybe the husband or the wife dies and there's so much tears. Someone else can fill that office. Hmm? The pastor dies. Someone else can what? Fill that office. But if he's not present in his habitation, it will remain desolate. And what is the authority behind what they wanted to do as it is written? In the book of Psalms. Are you there? This was what led to the replacement of who? Judas Iscariot. It means Judas Iscariot did not make it to heaven. His habitation. When we get there, you will see this place was meant for Judas. You will see it. And you know that somebody is absent here. So they had to fill up his bishopric. Your habitation will not be desolate. And they brought in Matthias. 
because Jesus set up a system that was operating to the base number 12. Huh? So you will notice that there are some individuals called 144,000. Divided by 12 is what? Huh? Because it's base number 12. So we we'll need to add somebody else so that it can be 12. Because what we are talking about here is a system that is built according to structural alignment. If you see the people that gave their life to Christ, any time they preached, it was a certain number. The first time it was, how many souls? 3,000 souls. That's structural alignment. They were not, they were not, they were multiplying. They were not, the progression was geometric, not arithmetic. I don't have time. I don't have time for that. Uh, are you with me? <laughs> Not for today. Not for today. But stay with me. The, the progression was what? Was geometric. Because of structural alignment. That's the first thing that they did. Second thing that they did is what I want to read, which is Acts chapter 2. From verse number 42, this was their operating system. This was the scope of their operations. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So they had a four-point agenda. That's what they did. Apostles' doctrine, I don't have time to explain that. But I have time to show you that doctrine there is singular. It's apostles that is plural. Oh, you are not with me. Are you with me? I have enough time to show you that. I have enough time to show you that in the book of Hebrews chapter 6, the Bible speaks about the principles, and principles is plural, but doctrine is singular. Don't worry. When we come for apostolic recalibration, it's for pastors, people that are into ministry. We'll start with doctrine. Then I will prove, we will prove to you how many of you are part of the problem or part of the solution. True doctrine. Just doctrine. I will show you the 10 levels of the gospel and then we'll find out what you preach. Then you'll see the people that are part of the problem. Yes, we need telescopic eyes so that... Do you understand? We can see from the strategic level. They continued steadfastly. Notice that these were routines and rituals that never ended. So there was a prayer culture. If you came into their midst, you'll be afflicted with so much prayer that somewhere along the line, you too will pick up the life of prayer. Yes, that's how it was. It, it don't, that's why the Bible says people, there were people that loved what they were doing, but they, they, they never joined them. The reason was because, hey. <laughs> Ooh. The moment you enter, there's a mechanical energy that they generate through prayer. Mechanical. It is this mechanical energy that, that gives life to everything, to their worship, to their evangelism, to their business, to their mechanical energy. They were generating it. It was prayer. You know, we stopped at prayer yesterday. That's why I have to come here to continue. So prayer was their mechanical energy. The prayer wheel kept moving. And as long as it was moving, it could give life to Bible study. It could give life to worship. It could give life. Oh my God. Oh, eh, eh. The merchandise that they had was life. But today we have built city churches that is based on customer care and participation. The, the pastor is so concerned about the alignment of his tie and it must be silk. Comes with half an entourage.
because the pinnacle of the civilization is six, is man. And that's Babel, that's Babylon. But what Moses went to do on the mount was to peep into something in the heavens and then to build context and perspective and establish it here so that the dimensions of heaven can begin to operate among the people. So they are mechanical energy that drove everything they did because they continued. How, how did they continue? They continued steadfastly. One stroke will not bring that giant down. You need to learn how to prepare for a marathon and not a sprint because victory is all about outlasting the devil. So when you, when you learn how to pray, learn how to pray large because your life will depend on it. You remember yesterday he spoke a parable to this end that men ought always to pray and not to fail. So I'd like you to see if prayer becomes a culture in your life as an individual, in our corporate life as a fellowship, then we are eligible for what I call feedback. Let me show you feedback. Let me show you feedback from verse 43. This, this, this is a documentary of feedback. And fear came upon every soul. And that's one, fear. The fear of God was in the company. Are you there? Today there's no fear of God. A pastor can steal, can be a thief, and he's boasting. A pastor is caught in immorality. He, you know, he, he, he's trivialized. He's trivialized. He said, no, these things, you know. We are first men before we are men of God. <laughs> he's boasting. Can you see that there is a dimension in the heavens that have been trapped here? The fear of God has been trapped among them. The fear of God is not a citizen of the earth. It's a citizen of heaven. But he's trapped among their company. And fear came upon every soul. The revelation of God's awesome holiness hit the camp. This is a version of sociology you cannot find in the textbook. This is the culture of heaven. Fear. Do you still fear God? When you are alone, you fear Him. I don't want to break His heart. Eh? There were times I came to the pulpit, I preached powerfully. Then I missed it. Then He expresses His displeasure. Meanwhile, people are healing me and miracles are taking place. I leave that place to go and beg him for, for days. You know why? He's all I have. But a lot of people can get by and continue doing their mechanical stuff without him. So they can sin, they don't care. Just there, say, you know, this, there's a grace, there's a grace, there's a grace. That's Babylon. It is a science that was pioneered by one of the fallings. At the Tower of Babel. It has, it has lived on in the hearts of men that are not loyal to Jesus Christ. So fear came upon every soul. Then the, the, the sec, second feedback was that signs and wonders became commonplace. The signs of God. The wonders of God, because the dimensions of God were trapped. No man can predict what will happen when they come together. You know, the way we were floating in, in, in worship, no man can predict what, what that river will produce. Signs and wonders were done by the hands of the apostles and they that believed were together that's unity and they had all things in common a lot of us think unity is union those of us that were on campus that were in 
um, the student union. You, we are an activist. It, it's not, that's not unity. I know you guys were able to get some things done. You, you apply pressure and the, the school authorities say, okay, oh, 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 okay, all right, let's, 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 let's sit down, let's discuss it. That's union. Unity is first in the spirit. My spirit will align with yours. There will be witness in my spirit that yes, we are kingsmen. For the Bible says, and for no we know man after the flesh. Are you there? So when I met my friend, Dr. Rodney, I, I, I knew he was my kinsman. That he knows my God. The moment we are separated onto the same thing, onto the same person, we will not find any difficulty in connecting in the natural. For the spirit within us will bear witness. You don't need to struggle. You don't need to. No, I don't struggle. I don't struggle. Every time I violated the witness of the Holy Spirit and connected with somebody, it produced, Satan dealt a very terrible blow on my life. I've since become wise. Henceforth, no we, no man after the flesh. They all had all things, they were together and had all things in common. Still feedback. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Hallelujah. This was an economic principle. An economic principle was alive amongst them. This principle cannot be seen in capitalism. Cannot be seen in socialism. This is different. And this was how they conquered poverty in their midst. So somebody can be putting on a Rolex watch and then on Wednesday you see the same Rolex watch in somebody else's hand because the Holy Spirit has prompted him to, to release. So the Holy distribution takes place. And then you find people in some conditions. God will speak to somebody and say, go and send a hundred thousand rand to them. No human being told him. He came and distributed and what they needed to climb to the next level was that 100,000. It was an economic principle that was not in the textbooks. Oh my God. I, I want your eyes to be open to see the culture of heaven trapped among men. If we replicate these dimensions, nobody will want to miss church. Church will be like an ivory tower of light. Today we see flesh on the pulpit. Flesh. And the moment flesh begins to cover the space, the Holy Spirit quietly withdraws and he allows men to, to be doing their marketing. Hallelujah. They sold their goods and possessions and parted them. To all men, as every man had need, so they killed poverty. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house. They eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God. God was the pinnacle of, of, of their civilization and having favor with all the people. When they went out to their offices, the unbelievers favored them. Not because they were good people. It was because they were carrying something that was glorious. It's just like uh, the, the, the Egyptians, uh, the Jews went to the Egyptians and asked them for what they needed for their trip. And even though the Egyptians were wicked people, there was something on the Jews that made them not to be able to resist them. Do you understand? And the Bible says that they spoiled. When you go to walk to the bank with that glory upon your life, you cannot be resisted. You'll be given opportunities that you are not qualified for. 
the reason why our nations are sick is because the church is sick. If we can restore this pattern where we trap the dimensions of God, a new civilization breaks out amongst us, you will see that lands will fall. Because the Bible says, praising God, and they had favor with all the people. And even though, with or without evangelism, the Lord added unto their numbers such as should be saved. Can you see the feedback? Now I need to teach you the language of the Spirit. John chapter 6. The language. John chapter 6. If you have it, please, on the screen, give it to me. I'm going to round up right now. I will introduce it, but I will not teach it because I want to end the theory part quickly so that we can call on the healer to heal. Those kind of things happen naturally when we trap the dimensions of God down. John chapter 6 verse 63. Please give me on the screen there. The King James Version says it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you they are spirit and they are life. So I told you yesterday that there are words that are spirit. There are words that are infused with life. They can produce results. And Jesus is saying the words that I'm speaking to you is not in Zulu. It's not in Swahili. I've forgotten all the other tribes. not in English language. It's not in French. I speak spirit. <laughs> and these words can produce life. So there are words that are spirit and life. Come with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11. I'll read from verse 1 to 3. Do a little explanation. I will stop my talk. Then we'll use 35 minutes to do the healing. And I'll show you how easy it is to be healed. The supernatural. That's God's prescription for human life. That we might do the natural supernaturally and do the supernatural naturally. And grace will come into your vessel tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, last scripture for the night. Um, Isaiah chapter 11, then I read from verse 1 to 3. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and mind, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the law. He's actually talking about the grace that will be on the Messiah. He's talking about Jesus. Come with me to verse 3. And he shall make him of quick understanding. My emphasis is quick. If you click on quick, just in case you have a Bible that is equipped with a Lexicon. If you click on quick, the Hebrew word you will find there is ruach. Ruach means the breath of God. Oh my God, you are not here. Are you here? Ruach means the breath of God. And so the Bible says that when God releases ruach into your spirit, You will no longer judge after the sight of your eyes or after the hearing of your ears. It means this ruach 
can be a very perfect substitute for your natural senses. I'm still teaching you the language. Ruach. It will be a substitute for your natural senses. Because when the breath of God comes upon your spirit, are you still with me? Something happens. And I need to explain what happens. Jesus in the book of John, chapter 3, the Bible says that it was a man of the Pharisees whose name was Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. I don't want to explain that. But Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So I looked up the word see in Greek. It's idol. Idol means senses. Oh, you don't get it. Okay, see. When you were nine months old in your mother's womb, you had eyes. Your eyes were developed. Doctor, am I saying the truth? Your eyes are fully developed, your lungs are fully developed, your legs are fully developed, but your eyes were not meant for the womb. You had to be born into the natural world before your eyes became relevant. Is that true? So Jesus is saying that your spirit also has spiritual senses, but you need to be born again first before those senses will become functional. Except a man be born again, he cannot idle see the kingdom of God. Your spiritual senses will give you insight into perceiving kingdom things. You have been born into another realm. You can perceive it now. So when Ruach comes, what it does is that it activates those senses. So you can perceive things in the spirit and the things you perceive in the spirit are superior to the things that you see with your physical senses. So your judgment will no longer be according to the sight of your eyes or the hearing of your ears but by Ruach. By Ruach. If you operate by Ruach, you know what business to invest in. Meanwhile, the financial chart might not predict it. It might look, it might look impossible according to the current financial chart. But you see, you are no longer judging after the sight of your eye. You judge by rock. See, there is every provision in the Holy Ghost for you to get ahead in life, for you to be a victor. For you, oh my God, there's every provision to ensure that you're not a victim of the inflation, the economy. So I will stop here for today. But our prayer point, you see, I can't teach the language. I just showed you the introduction to the subject. After this, I'm supposed to show you the, alph the alphabet of spirit language. A, B, C, D, E. I'm supposed to show you that. So that you can make words. You can become wise by the Holy Ghost. You can become filled with all spiritual knowledge and understanding. But we are praying now. And the prayer we are praying is that, Lord, send me Ruach. So that I will not judge after the sight of my eyes or the hearing of my ears. Rise on your feet. Let's pray. And if you pray this prayer, Sincerely from your heart, the Lord will answer. That's how we have lived. I was in the oil industry. I was doing very well, very, very well. I had so many prospects. And just before I became a manager, two weeks before I became a manager, Ruach came to me. 
the voice of my master came to me, asking me to resign. Everybody felt the demons I used to cast on the crusade ground had finally manipulated my destiny. I was a technocrat. I was, I was good at, at what I did. I resigned. Today, I thank God that I did not judge after the sight of my eyes. What God did in response to my obedience is that he gave me the anointing that he's speaking to you today. Because of that anointing, there was a nation, a nation, that the anointing, the anointing did something in that nation. And I got an invitation from a nation, not, not from a church to come and do a conference. I got a nation invited me and said, please come. Because of what he gave me. Because of obedience. He shall make you quick. of quick understanding and the fear of the Lord and you shall not judge after the sight of your eyes oh, there is a civilization God is calling you into you will not judge after the hearing of your ears but with righteousness you will judge the poor can we pray and say Lord activate my spiritual senses so that I will live above the realm of my physical senses. Somebody cry to him. Somebody cry. Somebody cry. Somebody cry to him. Hombes ele coria brisco fatama deli e sominanta yita cumbre mambalata uske brevelete kundi balatua jubri ala baboske te brande bakunda isko bendolo reko siko talabo sontelia bresko fila iska brende leke deli Shaminai kumbresko fala bodo Latros keto benjo koboroska debi Natalia Ambre kose kile kete borokonsame And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes He shall not judge after the hearing of his ears Ifotele bresko borondo Maka bresko filakade mandolo Ebro koskito bre rakado de manshalata Ibrama koria sike brande kosato Yaito seligo bonde Broske tamande bobonia sike Amalaita Sofila kombres kanteli Esco for the Nisa le Cabola, a light on Presca Vata Mandala, Escovilai Combolo, Rocco Sonde, Shamine Kendele Beboria, Ascavo Siva, Ascavo Malacale, Asca Santa Baboria, Asca Meliate, Brescate, Racate, Mecate, Roque Mate, Ayetos Keda Mandale. Sike la hare masaria e proskete kende mori a subela a prasketo menande diaba yeah roko mosada bali escabaida robe na kaskendo bosi prasketo ke la bande mala ai kasko bolote e prekela a samakuria. Jabalote, raka bababata, isko be mashali, alai kombroska, liga bando kumina, asole, lakabosi, yeta gandala, 
Akrabasha Kobregede Ruka Besha Ido Bontame Rada Bokota Balatale Aila la 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 Roskaya Masiko Babala Ramba Soke Dele Edebokore Geminaito Raska Tobelite Escubi Rama Sandeli Rama Sukatala Randa Babalatabu Randa Sukayala Escombala Escababala Ebranda Bala Egababala Ezia la Babala Raka Bala Raka Bala Raka Selaba Raka Babonde Raka Masande Raka Babolata Raka Balaite Raka Babolata Asambre Kotali Saibo Ramanele Ise Sele Kobasuma Raiko Selide Ebraminande Escababondele Esima Landelia Egambros Kondo Egambra Katala Egalaita Kumbame Egalaita Koselana Ambresco Veladi Agalato Kosketomondo Ombresco Menakadababoria Raita mama mosam Rako no seminal Rako sebedete Glory to your name. that presence is in our midst anything that is not of him can be expelled in a moment of time the Lord will begin to heal just take the following instructions if you are deaf maybe in one of your ears you cannot hear take this finger put it in the ear that cannot hear and block it completely if it's this one or if it's this one If you have problems with your eyes and you need to use spectacles to read or to drive, you can remove the spectacles, put your hands on your eyes. You came here with a cane, you walk with crutches, lay your hands on the paralyzed legs. You feel pain on any part of your body. There's a growth on your body. There's a tumor, a fibroid, cancer, any growth that has not been planted by God. Put your hand where it is as we pray together. You have pains, put your hand where the pain is. If I say in the name of Jesus, you say a big amen. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 
Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bind every blinding spirit. Blinding spirits be bound in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out of the eyes in Jesus' name. I address every deafening spirit. Deafening spirits be bound. Come out of the ears in the name of Jesus. Oh, I speak to long conditions, long conditions, asthmas, respiratory tract diseases, anything that has to do with your respiration. I arrest the spirits responsible. I break their yoke in the name of Jesus. I command them to come out, come out, come out, come out. I speak to that migraine. I command it to fall off your head in the name of Jesus Christ. I speak to that pain. I say pain, go. Pain, go. Pain, go. Pain, go. Pain, go. In the name of Jesus. Oof. I speak to that yoke that you are carrying and I command it come off them come off them I arrest that spirit of paralysis and I break his hold upon you in the name of Jesus Christ I command the whole broken in Jesus mighty name now I release the healing anointing to bring about a cure on your body from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet be healed be healed be healed be healed be healed in the name of Jesus so I command those eyes eyes see in Jesus name I command the ears here in Jesus name I command that paralyzed part of your body I say receive life in the name of Jesus Christ I command that pain now go 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 in the name of Jesus so the healing has started The river is flowing now. Ooh. Ooh. So yeah, I command the yoke. Break, 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 break. 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 Be healed. Be healed. Be healed in Jesus' name. You may be seated. I want you to conduct a test. This test will be for two minutes, two minutes, because I just have 10 minutes left, two minutes. If you notice that you can see or you can hear or the pain on your body has left, come here. I'll take three, three testimonies, then I'll release what I came with on your life. So that such as I have, I will give you. There's a change. Come here. There's, um, the pain has gone. The hearing has been restored. Come here. come here there's someone that came here with a condition um, uh, excruciating pain associated with your back at, uh, at your waistline and that came because of uh, an, an accident that you had and you've been managing it sometimes it's very excruciating check that place you'll see that the angel has taken away that pain Anyone that is born of Jesus, that is well trained, can operate in healing. So when we do those ministers conferences, I will teach you how to heal the sick. Part of our assignment is to demystify the supernatural. 
so that everyone can walk in it because it's our heritage in God. 